and now here we begin it's as how it all began was as i have mentioned in my abstract we all know i'm not going into the general aspects which is quite familiar to all of you india had has had profound influence in southeast asia in terms of religion art architecture and several other aspects of culture both north india and south india have contributed at different levels at different times for this amalgamation and different regions of southeast asia singapore malaysia more nearer home myanmar earlier called burma vietnam laos thailand and cambodia all have benefited by this interaction at different levels in different degrees at different periods of history in some periods one country got more in other periods other countries of southeast asia got more from india some 10 years ago a group of scholars and others had visited cambodia it was serious tourism not a very scholarly visit but definitely a well informed visit it did not have a professional archaeologist or art historian in the team and they of course did a detailed study tour of the place and felt that there is much of south india in it it was just their inkling back home in south india they wanted to appoint a full time researcher to work on this and analyze this and i was chosen for this project i was hesitant i was warned because it's easy to say what went from india but rather very difficult and hazardous to pinpoint what came from the south one has to be doubly sure but then i took it up as a challenge it involved field visits to cambodia much later i got opportunities for library and archival research in the us and it has led to certain very pertinent observations which do have relevance to syncretism which i am going to share with you today and i am quickly going over the maps we may not need it we will come back to it if we need to identify some of the places that i am going to mention in the course of my talk now i am beginning with the basics with the mythological interactions between india and cambodia then the prehistoric and then come to the more stable more concrete evidence centric early historic and later period interactions cambodia as we know today in inscriptions and ancient literature it's kambuja or kambuja desha it has many other names the french called it kambuj and each name has a story to tell then there are the remote prehistoric links being prehistory with hardly any written evidence it's difficult to prove or disprove but books do inform us prehistory specialists do tell us that cambodia had stone age settlements with affinities with india's stone age settlements especially in south india and then cambodia learned the use of iron around 500 bce from either india or china lot of migrations have taken place from india and china to cambodia through the ages it's difficult to say what went from india and what went from china and within india what went from the south or the north now just to give you a very very brief outline of cambodia's political history for those who may not be familiar with it i am not doing it correspondingly for india i am presuming all of you would be knowing more about india this cambodia's recorded history 
it starts with the Funan period, Funan referring to a kingdom which ruled in from with its epicenter of power from the central part of Cambodia up to the mid 6th century. Then comes the Chenla period, which was ruling north of Funan, and they later dominated and became the prime force or kingdom ruling most parts of Cambodia from the mid 6th to the to 802 CE, a very brief period. Then comes the Anchor period, where again the north of Cambodia dominated 800 to 1431 or 32, the golden age of Cambodian history. And the Anchor period roughly corresponds with the Chalukya, Pallava and Chora period of South Indian history. And then after the anchor period, one can call it the Dark Age. We do not know much of Cambodia history. More research needs to be done. But Cambodia lost valuable territories to neighboring kingdoms, including Vietnam and Thailand, till finally the French began to rule Cambodia from around 1864 to 1953. And after that, you know, we had that violence in 1970s and 80s, the Khmer Rouge, after which peace and the traditional monarchy has been restored in Cambodia with the king ruling it from the capital, Phnom Penh. Their flag, which has Angkor Wat, their main monument in it, probably the only country in the whole world which has on its flag a historical monument that to a world heritage site and everything is anchor for them anchor is a common name for many of their commercial products national symbols and so on some pictures of anchor vat and how it has been overgrown with jungle in recent years and how teams of archaeologists from different countries, including from the Archaeological Survey of India and more from the southern part of our country, trying to restore these monuments and save them from further destruction from trees, jungle growth and other elements. Now, these anchor ruins it's a romantic tale, but I'm going to be very brief with just one slide. There, it was built during this anchor period, the golden age, from 802 to 1431. No construction before or after that, mostly. And then they went into ruins, overgrown with forests and jungle, almost the same story as our own monuments like Ajanta, Elora, Mahabalipuram, and much more till they were rediscovered by the European colonial powers. Again, like our own Indian ruins and monuments, the first came the Portuguese, but then they had the Spanish, the Japanese, and the French. And Henry Muhot was one of the first, his name is famous. He was not the first, but one of the first, a French naturalist who discovered or rather rediscovered and wrote a lot about it in 1860s and he died very early in life at the age of 35 while still on field work but his writings were carefully sent by his colleagues to his family and friends back in France and it was later published in French and much later in English and it has become very popular but even before him Cambodia had emerged as a, a important tourist destination and also uh, it, it, it became popular and it uh, uh, has been a subject of study by the French and others even before him. Now coming to the core of the paper, the South India-Cambodia links, I told you we'll begin with the legendary ones. There's a lot of stories. These are stories, mind you. It's interesting to listen to them. They come more in the realm of legend, not even mythology, because they are not religious stories per se. 
and they have a lot of affinities with similar stories in India. So one can only say that the interactions began in the remote times and can be traced to legendary fables, nothing more. One can also dispute it, but one can definitely say there would be, there could be some uh, affinity between the stories. When you come to the Pallavas, the famous South Indian dynasty that ruled over large parts of South India between around the 3rd to the 8th, 9th century, you have a series of sculptures in one of their temples, the Vaikuntha Perumal Temple of Kanchipuram, which traces in its historical sculpture panels, their mythical origin and then their dynastic history up to the time of some of the important events of the builder of that temple in the 8th century. And it often says of several sages, one of them was Drona, whom you see in this panel, a close-up view of him, and then his son Ashwatthama, and Ashwatthama not wanting to marry, but the gods wanting the lineage to continue and sending a nymph to entice him and then she Menaka comes and then the result is achieved. The baby is born. You see the baby resting on a cradle of sprouts which could uh, and that's how they say that was Pallava which also has a, one of the meanings of the term meaning sprout and he was the first Pallava king and after that it's recorded history. And also we do have certain other such stories of one of the early Pallava kings. Uh, he was stranded or, or, or marooned on a coast or a river bank and a princess comes to rescue him and they get married and the dynasty starts. And some of these stories are recorded by C. Meenakshi, the eminent Pallava history historian. And we have similar such stories for Cambodia also. Often the stories say of a prince going from India and defeating the princess there and getting married. And often the name of the person going from India is Kaundinya and their progeny becoming the royal lineage of Cambodia. So, so much for the legendary links. Now we come to more recorded history the ancient Rome Asia trade, which began from around 300 BCE, lasted till the 4th, 5th century CE. Even after the split of the Roman Empire into two, Rome and Byzantium. And so the, this trade, we all know, now much research has been done. India, especially South India, traded with Rome and we know the a lot of spices and other things went from India to Rome and in return we got wine, olive oil and some other items from Rome. And this was not, it was a very big trade, much more than what we imagine it to be. Latest research shows it was not a simple Rome-India trade, it was part of a far-flung trade network which extended from Southeast Asia, Sri Lanka, China, mainland India, Africa and finally Italy. So ships were sailing from Putioli or Puzzoli in southern Italy up to Southeast Asia and South India became the hub of the trade a transit depot where goods or merchandise from Southeast Asia, including Cambodia and Thailand, came to South India for onward transmission to Rome. And we have discovered, as may all of you know, hundreds and hundreds of Roman gold and silver coins and a few other Roman objects in Kerala. Patanam excavations have now become famous and many more sites in South India, including Tamil Nadu. We have discovered such finds to a lesser extent in Sri Lanka and to a still lesser extent in China and Southeast Asia, including Cambodia. We have discovered Roman coins in 
Vietnam and Cambodia, similar to the ones found in South India. So uh, the, this trade network in the early historical period, it establishes with concrete evidence the interactions between South India and Cambodia. Now coming to, again, going deeper into the subject, what exactly went from India to Cambodia? Before I assert what went from the South, it's basically religion, both Buddhism and Hinduism, and of course the Sanskrit language. All these three elements were equally popular in most parts of India, North and South. So it's very difficult to say what could have gone from the North or from other regions. But shortly, we would come to certain elements which definitely went from the South. Now, coming to the South, we have two things here which I would like to focus before going on to specifics. And when I say South, it was basically the Chalukyas and Pallavas. The Guptas were also ruling, but the Gupta rule, as you all know, ended by the fifth century. But the Chalukyas continued and Pallavas continued still longer, till the 8th, 9th century. And some of the late Pallava rulers were contemporaries of the early anchor period rulers of Cambodia. There are two specific elements which are interrelated, which we do believe went among the several things which went from India to Cambodia. One is the Devaraja concept or Devaraja cult and closely linked to that is the concept of royal shrine. Devaraja cult, just as we have this unique seminar on syncretism some 20 years ago, when I would say I was almost a beginner in the field, I still vividly recall the National Museum in New Delhi had a similar seminar on the Devaraja concept where I spoke. And this Devaraja concept basically having believing or hailing the king to be God. That was very popular in India. Gupta period, it was well known. Many of the Gupta rulers identified themselves with one of their favorite gods, Vishnu. They called themselves Parama Bhagavata. One of the Gupta kings of the 5th century, later Gupta kings, Skanda Gupta, he even called himself Devaraja. The concept was equally popular in the South among the Chalukyas and the Pallavas and still later among the Choras. And then we have the closely linked to it was the Royal Shrine. The concept of a Royal Shrine is still a bit vague. Different books and scholars would interpret it in different ways. But basically it's a shrine mostly built in the capital city by the king fully sponsored and patronized by the royal family with involvement of different members of the royal family and the king himself would often or the royal family would worship there and that is the basic simplified definition of a royal shrine there's much more to it and the kailasanatha temple of kanchipuram built by the Pallava king Rajasimha, Narasimha Varman II, who ruled from around 700 to 728 CE. That is considered to be one of the earliest and most important royal shrines, which fulfills all the terms I mentioned in the definition. Built in the capital city, involvement of multiple royal family members, his wife or queen Rangapataka, his son Mahendra, they have all contributed to the building of the temple. And then this Kailasanatha was the forerunner of many, very many such royal shrines in South India. Another view of Kailasanatha, a better view. And then coming to the Western Chalukyas in Pattadakkal, you have the Sangameshwara temple, which is considered the first, and that was also considered to be a royal shrine built by Vijayaditya and named as Vijayeshwara after the king himself. And uh, even the Kailasanatha temple is sometimes called Rajasimeshwara after the king. 
and uh, uh, God inside the temple is often identified with the builder king of the temple. And then you have more such temples in Patadakkal, the Virupaksha and Malikarjuna, which are also considered to be royal shrines. And the zenith of it was the Brihadishwara temple of Tanjavur, built by Rajaraja the one, the great Choda king, uh, who ruled from around 985 to 1012 CE. And again, that God inside that is called both Brihadishwara or Rajarajeshwara. And the temple itself is called Rajarajeshwaram after its build. And this concept of Devaraja and royal shrine did go to Cambodia. The Angkor Wat itself is considered one such major royal shrine and we have many more of it. Now to certain peculiar, unmistakable, but little known, but nonetheless very significant aspects of why we say there was unmistakable Pallava impact on Cambodia. We know Mahendra Varman, one of the early Pallava kings. He was not the earliest. There were quite a few before him. But most books start with Mahendra Varman because the genealogy and full details of his predecessors and even their dates are not very clear for historians. And this Mahendra Varman, the one is famous for history and architecture. He having started the practice of rock cut architecture in this part of the country, he had different titles or birudas, more than 100 of them some of which are not very intelligible to the epigraphist even now. And there is a theory that some of these uh, out of the way, not so easily understood titles or birudas of his could be in the Khmer language. Then another affinity is the suffix Varman, which was common among Pallava kings, Mahendra Varman, uh, Narasimha Varman, Nandi Varman, Buddha Varman, we even had a Buddhist uh, king, they say in the early period, Shivaskanda Varman, Virakurcha Varman, and so on. And we have the same for the Cambodia kings. Of course, there are no two common Varmans between the two. There we have a different set of Varmans, Jaya Varman, Indra Varman, Surya Varman, and Chandra Varman. And then, of course, the most perplexing or rather I would say the controversial part, but there is a theory put in publication, so I can and should mention it. We are not too sure of the origin of the Pallavas from where they came. Some say they came from remote North India. Others say they came from Andhra. Anyway, they came from somewhere north of Tamil Nadu, whether immediate north or further north. And at one stage, the family split into two. After Simma Vishnu and Bhima Varman, the family, one part of the family split and went somewhere. And when Parameshwara Varman II died without a male heir to the throne, there was a need to have a new king. And the scholars in the university in Kanchipuram felt that the new person should be from the royal lineage and so they went in search of him and that's how they discovered Nandi Varman, the son of uh, who was a sixth direct descendant of Bhima Varman and brought him to Kanchi. And there is a theory whether he could have been brought all the way from Cambodia but Others say it's too far-fetched a theory, but definitely from art historical and other evidences, he was brought from a distant place, crossing forests, rivers, mountains, till he landed in Kanchi, crowned himself as the king, and the rest is history. Now we'll come to more specific thing, the temple architecture traits. The Vaikuntha Perumal temple, we are going back to it. One of the important temples of the Pallavas built by the same Nandi Varman Pallava Malla who ruled from around 732 to 796 who came from somewhere to Kanchipuram belonging to the royal family. It has great style architectural affinities with the Angkor Wat. Both are 
three tier temples those who have been to vaikuntha perumal would recall such a three tier temple is rather rare in, in south indian or indian temple architecture i could give you just two more examples vaikuntha perumal being one like a pyramid there are three sanctums exactly one above the other and the three levels of the temple rise up slightly tapering till they end up like a pyramid and the uh, there is a sundaravarada perumal temple at uttirameru again not too far from kanchi representing the same three tier concept and then we have the kudal alagar temple in madurai and a few others i am told in the deep south but anyway their numbers are far too few in india compared to the hundreds and thousands of temples that we have here Angkor Wat was also a three-tier temple, and like Vaikuntha Perumal, it was originally designed as a temple for Vishnu, with Vishnu occupying the topmost sanctum. Both these temples face west, and both these temples have a string of historical sculptures depicting dynastic history at the lower most level. Both Angkor Wat and Vaikuntha Perumal, and this is Kudal Aragar. and then even the brihadeeshwara temple though not exactly three tier there uh, there is some architectural resemblance but that's not obvious because it's only one sanctum beyond which there's no sanctum but the circumambulatory passage goes up to two more levels with sculptures in it but they are no longer accessible to the general tourists now the next photograph would make it clear by what i mean because we can only access the lower level of the temple with its sanctum and the, that is what we access the sanctum with its circumambulatory passage with the famous fresco paintings access through the ardha mandaba but beyond that it does have two levels which can be reached but no sanctum only the passage after which it becomes a hollow vimana or tower now coming to anchor wat i'm going to show you some pictures to show how it was also graded as a three tier monument of course in a different way and now much of it has been damaged it has suffered more damage than the temples in india so now general tourists or visitors just as we are not allowed to the upper levels of brihadeeshwara temple we are also not allowed to the topmost level of anchor wat because the steps are narrow steep and broken it's only with special permission for research we could go there but if we are able to access the topmost level we see the place where vishnu ashtabuja perumal was originally installed but sometime in the 15th or 16th century that idol was removed and was replaced by buddha and it continues to be a buddhist shrine but the aspect relevant for syncretism is although made into a buddhist shrine by replacing the main idol or figure with a in the main sanctum at the topmost level none of the other sculptures or iconographic arrangements within the temple were damaged or changed we have lot of vishnu and other hindu themes all over the temples which are still seen well preserved and some of which are even worshiped to this day by the locals now similar thing we can see in a few graded tiya temples in certain other parts of cambodia near, not too far from angkor wat and one of them is beyond which also has multiple levels and it also has historical sculptures and then we have another half finished monument on the bank of the siam reap river takio these art historians or other architectural historians say that takio has similar plan to brihadeeshwara temple of tanjore 
both were conceived around the same time angkor wat is 100 years after the tanjore temple early 12th century or rather mid 12th century bhradishwara you can say early 11th century and same thing with takyo but takyo was again planned as a three tier shiva temple but for reasons unknown was never completed according to art historians had it been completed it would have been one of the grandest temples dominating the skyline of cambodia probably even grander than angkor wat but that was not to be we have got some line plans of takyo done by historians which i'll show you done by french historians and then all these temples another concept was they were surrounded by a moat to show that it was a mountain or meru surrounded by the ocean and we do have the bhradishwara temple the concept was there in india but not all temples were surrounded by moats bhradishwara temple in tanjore is surrounded by a moat which is now in disuse they are trying to restore it but that moat mind you is not coeval with the temple it was built much later at least 400 years after the temple by the local nayak kings but angkor wat has a beautiful moat surrounding it coeval with the temple itself and then just to show you coming from architecture we come to the sculptures the string of historical sculptures parts of which i showed you to substantiate my arguments this is from vaikuntha perumal and then you have similar sculptures in angkor wat and also in beyon here you see a king prostrating before vishnu before embarking on a war in beyon now we come to the most interesting part sculpture iconography affinities i am confining myself only to certain very rare or little known forms what i consider rare or little known and others can enlighten me they may they are little known but not maybe as little known as i conceptualize them to be we know everything went from south india or other parts of india to cambodia all the secret images which represent syncretism whether it's harihara ardhanarishwara and all others and they went very early we have harihara and ardhanarishwara images as early as 4th 5th century in the museum in the capital nom pen but i am not going into them i am going to give you some very specific things this is an ashtabuja vishnu which is in the ashtabuja perumal temple in kanchipuram believed to be of the pallava period definitely it was restored and rebuilt later and then this concept of ashtabuja perumal which we believe went from south india to cambodia how it came it's difficult to say tracing the history of the very concept of ashtabuja perumal the earliest ashtabuja vishnu we see in mathura art then we see it in ikshvaku art we do believe ikshvakus migrated from the north to the south so it could have come from mathura to andhra and they built some of the most beautiful ashtabuja perumal temples ruins of which have been excavated at vijayapuri or nagarjuna konda and then we see much more of ashtabuja perumal in kanchipuram we do know pallavas came either from the north or from andhra but definitely passing through andhra and one of the early pallava king shivaskanda varman is believed to have defeated rudra purusha datta it's one of the last ikshvaku kings who ruled from 295 to 306 ce and then in kanchipuram you have too many ashtabuja perumal sculptures in vaikuntha perumal temple in many other temples including one temple exclusively devoted to that form of the deity after pallavas ashtabuja swami that that form of vishnu becomes rare we hardly have anything of that 
in Chora or even post Chora period in medieval temples of Kerala where painting was more popular. Again, I had an opportunity thanks to the Archaeological Survey of India to study them and some of you may be familiar with my book with Dr. Nambirajan on Kerala murals. We have a lot of are where I could see every form of Vishnu is depicted in Ashtabuja form. You have Ashtabuja Narasimha, as you see here. You have Ashtabuja Venu Gopala. This is from Triprayar. We have Ashtabuja Venu Gopala in many temples. And again in Triprayar, you even have an Ashtabuja Shiva and many other forms. In Kanchi, you have Ashtabuja Garudaruda Vishnu and many other Ashtabuja forms. And even in Cambodia, apart from Angkor Wat, in Prasad Kravan, a 10th century temple, you have Ashtabuja Perumal featured on the wall. You have other forms of Vishnu here, but not Ashtabuja on the same temple, Garuda Ruda Vishnu and even Lakshmi. And then coming to Angkor Wat, as I told you, the original image, this is the one which was installed on the topmost here in the sanctum of Angkor Wat and later we don't know the exact history at some point it was uprooted and damaged and a German team has recently restored it and it is placed at the entrance of Angkor Wat the Buddha image being placed at the sanctum now and it is being worshipped at the entrance and you also have a Lakshmi here unfortunately whose head is gone only the torso remains. As per Indian tradition, we would not worship an image which is deformed, but they do it. So Lakshmi is also worshipped there along with the Ashtabuja Vishnu, the original deity of the temple. And then another concept is a Samutra Mantana. All of you know the story. I am not going to elaborate. Churning of the cosmic ocean by the uh, asuras and the devas to get the nectar of life. The story is too well known in India. We have learnt it from school days, but its depiction in art is rather rare. We have them, but not too much, whether in the north or the south. We have them in Badami in cave number two and three, both Vishnu caves on the beam or lintel level. And then we also have them in Patadakkal in two, three places in the Virupaksha temple, one of the later temples of Patadakkal on a pillar or column close to the sanctum. We have this car, the churning of the cosmic ocean. And we also have it in the Malikarjuna temple, again, same period. They say both these were built by two sisters, the twin queens of Vikramaditya. And we have them in Angkor Wat, where one of the, the biggest Samutra Mantana in the whole world is in Angkor Wat, nowhere in India. And none of the few sculptures anywhere in India can equal in size and proportion to the one seen in Angkor Wat, where it occupies a full wall with one half by the Devas, the other half by the Asuras. And that's not all. It's also seen in on pillars, just as we see it in Patarakkal, we have them in pillars inside Angkor Wat, but many tourists often miss that. We also have them in Bayon, which where it's partly ruined, but we do have. Here you see the Kalasha or the pot emerging clearly, other parts of the sculpture being partially worn out. And so again, it's a concept which went from India most probably from South India, but got exemplified there in Cambodia. Then another thing is the Mahabharata story, which is featured in great detail all over India. It's featured in Angkor Wat also. One small but significant aspect of the story, Bhishma lying on the bed of arrows. We know why. We know the story, but often if you observe that particular scene is not featured in art in India mostly. I wouldn't know why. One temple priest gave me a logical explanation, the pain and pathos that it evokes. Bhishma, whom we all revere, we know what sort of a 
genius he was and he lying on a bed of arrows artists don't like to do that and so that's why it's rare it's not unknown but rare in indian art in cambodia in angkor wat among the mahabharata sculptures you see bhishma on the bed of arrows but first i'll show you the few examples from india again in the virupaksha temple of pattadakkal again in one of the pillars close to the main sanctum you have some mahabharata scenes not all of them but among them is a prominent one showing bhishma on the bed of arrows and then we have them only among the paintings medieval period paintings in kerala again quite rare in vadakunadar temple right in the heart of trichur you have a beautiful painting of bhishma almost relaxing on a pillow the only difference being the pillow being a bed of arrows and then in north india it's still rare but in some rajput paintings we do have it among the mahabharata painting folios that they have and then this is from angkor wat you see those lines and a man between the lines the lines being the arrows and the man being bhishma and now coming to one more thing one more aspect of sculpture which should have gone from india and this is definitely from the south with little doubt about it it's the cult or the concept or the depiction in art of karaikal ammaya one of the 63 nayanmars she is well known she is featured in several temples in medieval tamil nadu chidambaram kumbakonam tanjavur gangai konda cholapuram this is the gangai konda cholapuram shiva temple and she is often shown below the dancing shiva below nataraja playing cymbals for him and we all know the story she was lean frail we know she did penance involved having physical mortification and here is a close up view of her below nataraja in gangai konda cholapuram you could you would have seen it we can give you multiple examples of that sort and right in cambodia in bantesrei a temple around 30 miles from angkor wat bantesrei built in 10th century again it's not open to public now because it's it's not in a damaged condition they don't want crowds again above the ceiling of the entrance main entrance you have nataraja kaag and below him there is karaikal ammaya and even dr c shivarama murthy the renowned or pioneering art historian has confirmed its karaikal ammaya and her cult is confined to a small part of southern india she is not very well known or at least not featured in art too far from southern india and this could be an unmistakable evidence of the south indian impact on cambodian art now to some other pictures from the same bantasrei we have narasimha we have gajalakshmi and a few others now coming to the final part we have lot of language and script links also between south india and cambodia and how they went there in cambodia we have hundreds of inscriptions much of them studied by the french who occupied it during the time when epigraphy began to develop all over the world including india some of the inscriptions are in the native khmer language and in the khmer script others are in sanskrit language and in the grantha script again i am not going to go into the details you all know grantha was a script which evolved in south india more specifically the pallava kingdom hence the name pallava grantha and it was used mostly to write sanskrit in pallava kingdom we have a beautiful inscription in pallava grantha sanskrit in saluvan kuppam near mahabalipuram in south india and if we are having sanskrit inscriptions with grantha script in cambodia it could we could we can infer how it would have gone there even a localized if a localized skulls figure like karaikal ammaya went from here to there 
and a localized script like Grantha also went from here to there. It only shows the magnitude of the impact and the fusion. And then, of course, there are references to some saints and place names which can be controversial. There's a reference to Kanchipuram, but whether it refers to our Kanchipuram or some other Kanchipuram, even outside India, can be a matter of debate which scholars have to study in future years. It, it's not fully resolved. And this is a pillar with an inscription in the Khmer language on the topmost floor of Angkor Wat, the topmost level, which is difficult to access, where I had just one opportunity with a lot of paperwork. That's how it goes, because it is not allowed to general tourists. And just before I conclude, I think I've given you a very small, minuscule account of these influences. There is much more from my own research and much more from other works, but the, I think I have to stick to time. And so uh, I would just like to add just a few observations as concluding remarks. All of this went from India, some of it definitely, particularly from South India to Cambodia. It got absorbed there. One pertinent observation was how Buddhism and Hinduism and Buddhist art and Hindu art went from here, but there they intermingled, a rare example of syncretism. We have Buddha images in Vishnu temples there or even in Shiva temples, but it's not again exclusive to Cambodia. Even in Badami, you have within a Buddhist cave, a Hindu sage, and you have Buddha featured on the plinth of the Raja Gambira Tirumandabam or the Airavatishwara temple of Dharasuram. And again, a Buddha featured in the Brihadishwara temple itself. So the concept again is not new to India itself. Of course, the Buddha in a Vishnu temple, he would occupy a very distant place. I wouldn't call it insignificant. He wouldn't be very close among the main Devakoshtas. Rarely he has been there, even there. But in both Dharasuram and Tanjore, he's below the stairway and so on. And the syncretization in Cambodia continued. As I told you, Vishnu worship stopped. Angkor Wat itself got converted to a Buddhist shrine, but then the Vishnu or Hindu images were not damaged or changed. They continued to be preserved and even worshipped, and it continues till today, even after the 17th, 18th century colonial period and post-colonial, we see the same, and the Ashtabhuja Vishnu has been recently restored with modern technology, and has most recently been put back to worship. Of course, at the initial or the first level of Angkor Wat, the third level being occupied by Buddha of the 15th, 16th century. And we have more affinities in the case of personal and place names. Mekong, an important river of Cambodia, they say the word comes from Ma Ganga. And just as we have the Anai Malai and Cardamom Hills, the Elakai Malai, they also have the same with similar names. And if we have Lakshmi and Raja Lakshmi, they have the same names for gods, queens, and personal names. Only thing they had a suffix Kambuja Lakshmi and Kambuja Raja Lakshmi because it's Cambodia, which we don't have. And so with this, I conclude and say that the links continue till today and scholars and archaeologists from South India are now working to conserve Cambodia's heritage, which of course was given by India hundreds of years ago. And now India is helping to preserve the same. Thank you.